No, I traveled. You traveled. You traveled like 3.2 miles. I flew tough. from Logan. I know, but it was a hot day, and it was yeah. tough. Yeah. And if the car hadn't been waiting for me, it would have been really tough. I had to navigate all those Dunkin' Donuts in Boston to get to Logan again. Look at me, man. I'm like the uh, mayor of Dunkin', you know? Hey, we're twins today, except your clothes are so much more are. expensive. <laughs> Welcome to PTI, boys and girls. In today's episode, Rory McElroy reflects. Max Scherzer, warrior god, is ready to turn. And P.K. Subban joins us to preview tonight's Game 5 between the Oilers and Panthers. But we begin today with the end of the NBA Finals. Boston dominated Dallas from the middle of the first quarter on, finally winning by 18 points, winning the series 4-1. to Wilbon, you were there for every game. What did this series boil down to? A better team. Boston's a better team. Um, and Dallas didn't have anybody other than Kyrie Irving, who did not play well at all, stunk it up on the road, played well in two games at home. But that, that crowd, he, I, let me give him some credit for saying, for admitting, it got to him. All right? And he got what he deserved from, the, from, from Boston. He did. I mean, he, he did. turned yes, on he them. Did. They said, have some of this. Right. So we, Kyrie Irving plays half the series. That's not going to get it done. And also... Luka Doncic still navigating his way, trying to figure out whether he wants to be a truly great player or not. Meanwhile, Boston has already been through all of these issues in multiple conference finals, in a finals where they lost to Steph Curry and a real championship team uh, in Golden State. So when you, get, when you get Tatum and Brown, all right, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown playing like that, mm -hmm. and you get the support from the other players, it looks like a real Celtics team. Like all the Celtics teams, the Celtics teams had great players, whether you're talking about Russell and Kuzi or Cowens and Havlicek or Bird and Parrish and McHale, but they also had great support players. That's right. And that, and Drew Holiday, I hate to reduce Drew Holiday to that, and, and Horford, and I mean, they, they got great support, they got a great ensemble, and they were the better team. So I'm okay with the celebration of Boston, but yes. I want to add a certain dose of reality oh, here. Okay. This was a bad series. Okay, Dallas was an inferior opponent. It was a mismatch. It was a bad product for the, for the NBA. And I'll tell you what, not a single game went down to the last shot. No. Not a single game even went down to the last minute in this thing. It was, you talked about Kyrie Irving, absolutely awful in Boston. And yeah. that's karma. Yeah. His numbers in Boston, 18 out of 53 from the field, 3 of 17 from three, like not a, a you know, the games, Boston dominated the entire playoffs and dominated this part of it. They won series 4-1, 4-1, 4-0, 4-1. They were the best team out there all the time. And, and it, it, it was, again, it's a mismatch. Yeah, it was, Tony. And look, I had my doubts about Boston. I would voice them to you in texts and phone calls off the air. And here's why. One reason. Because they beat Miami without Jimmy Butler. I understand. They beat Cleveland with mostly without Donovan Mitchell and one of the bigs on Cleveland. Jared Allen. Jared Allen. Yeah. They beat Indiana without, essentially, without Halliburton very much. And so they won those series, and I'm thinking, all right, I need to see and something. And I get that. And in Dallas, you're right. Dallas did not put up a challenge in the game. Here's, they had two game three. Here's what's important series about over. Dallas. And Dallas got there fair and square. Yeah. Their players were healthy. I mean, you could say Dodgers wasn't healthy, but he was no, the same with all the He's They I didn't get to 100 points in the four games that they lost. Boston won by an it's average possible. of 12 and a half. We're going to look back at Boston, and their stars are young enough. Great run. Great in run. This, in these and playoffs. Tony, but you know what? You, you look, you covered the league longer than me. You know in that league, you've got to win multiples. Oh, no, you do. We'll get and to so that. So to be pronounced. We're going to get okay, to that. I'm just it, saying to you, these guys. there was not a signature moment in the entire finals. The signature moment of the playoffs was Jalen Brown in the corner, the corner hitting the three, Indy. forcing overtime. Yeah, game one. That was, that was it. All right, got to keep going. Let's All stay right. with the NBA. This will make you okay. happy, and we will look forward. All right. The last six NBA champions have been one and done. The last time that scenario occurred was 1980. Wow. In between were a lot of repeat wow. champions, mostly the Lakers, Celtics, and your Bulls. Spurs. Wilbon, were they repeats? They I don't think so. Do you Bulls. like Boston's chances of breaking the string of one-off champions? Not really. And I don't want people to think I'm always hating on the Celtics. No, I'm not hating the Celtics. I think what the Celtics just did, given the number of teams that were challengers, legit challengers, the old NBA, Tony, was top-heavy. 
you always had three or four teams, and you knew by the time you got to April, okay, we're down to we're going to get these two, and maybe you get an upset. But it was top-heavy, a top-heavy league. That's not the case anymore. So the Celtics next year, and I know the East looks like a walkover. I think Philly is going to get better. I think the Knicks healthy or a challenger right. anyway. And then you got Minnesota, Denver, Dallas, OKC. Maybe Phoenix tweaks it a little bit, and they, they, they mount a challenge. There's so many good teams and great players, and you can't amass them all. There's no more big three. A lot of people are going to have two good players and can challenge you. And I don't, I'm not, look, Denver a year ago, people were saying, oh, Denver's primed to repeat. No, okay. they didn't repeat. And I don't know that Boston will either. Let me say this. I think Boston is a really good team. They are. I think they went through the playoffs great. Yep. Okay, so what, 16 and 3? Seven and one on the road. I think if Porzingis is completely healthy, they may be a great team. I think that you could have given the finals MVP to the collective team or yeah. any one of four yeah. guys. Because yeah. let's look at this for a second. Porzingis off the bench wins game one. Holiday wins game two. Jalen Brown's the best player out there in game three. And Tatum is in four. And White is a ferocious offensive and defensive player. So to bet against them... Is pretty crazy. I'm not. Gonna, but, I'm going to take the field. Okay. And early I, on, and I probably I just think will there's as well. so many good teams. Yeah. You can get worn down. Now, now look, in the East, it's easier to go through. But I think. Let me just give you a for instance. Philly has 50 million dollars to spend. I'd spend it on Paul George and put him with Embiid and Tyrese Maxey. And I think you have a challenge. So this is what if I'm the saying. The Knicks, to you. your Knicks are healthy. This is, they're a challenge. This is what I'm saying to you. Okay. That in the NBA, this is not the NFL where you have to be crazy to bet against Mahomes. It's not that. In the NBA, one free agent in a strategic place can change everything yes. around. In the bubble, Anthony Davis has done that. Okay. Boston, though, Boston is built for the near term in this regard. Their roster is set. Shout they have no Brad free Steve. agents. Brad Stevens did a great job. They have no free agents. I think they have two important they players over just 30. Retire. Well, invaluable. they have two important. They have Horford and Holiday. Yeah. But I agree with you that Denver is good. I I'm tired of you telling me how great the West is because the West got ripped in this particular series. One series. But Denver is good. Minnesota is good. Oklahoma City is good. I think Milwaukee made a tremendous mistake trading for Damian Lillard. But Philadelphia may be good. Here here's the point you I want to make. You won't even mention the Knicks. You won't no, even I'm not them. mentioning the Knicks. Here's the point I want to make. In the landscape of the NBA right now, I don't see Bird, McHale, and Parrish. I don't see Shaq and Kobe. I don't see Jordan. That's the stuff dynasties are made of. Yeah. So are the Celtics made of dynasty, dynastic material? I don't know. I don't know. I think there are too many challenges. Okay. I think next year's a free-for-all. It's a battle royale. And look, they're the favorites, and they should be the favorites, the betting favorites, and thought of that way because of what they just did. Year taking the field. I'm just saying. Let's move to Rory McIlroy's agony of defeat. Rory bogeyed three of the last four holes in Sunday's collapse at the U.S. Open. Oof. He then left the course without talking oh. to the media. Worse yet, he didn't even congratulate his opponent. He's now released a statement calling it probably the toughest day he's had in his 17 years as a pro, vowing to show his resilience and belatedly congratulating Bryson DeChambeau on the win. Tony, how did Rory's statement sound to you? First of all, and I'm going to agree with you on this, it's nice that he issued a statement, but it was a day after the event. He should have met with the press directly after the event on Sunday, but I digress. How did it sound to me? I will remind you that yesterday morning on my podcast, we talked about Rory, and I said to you that in real time, when I saw him miss the second putt and knew that, or felt that he was going to lose then, I sort of thought, is this a career ender? And you said to me, of course not. You said to me, people choke and then they come back from yeah. it. But what I'm saying to you is this was a very public stage at the Open. This is now 10 years since he has won a major. His, his talking about the Saudi Tour and the PGA Tour has been out there for a while, and he's been the most demonstrative player on the PGA Tour about it. And now his personal life is out there for all the public to see. And maybe, Mike... Maybe the accumulation of all those things becomes too heavy 
to bear. I'm, I, I know he's going to play in the Scottish Open. I know he's going to play in the British Open. And like you, I hope he wins them both. Yeah, I do. But he has had public failures at the Masters. He's had this public failure now at the Open. He had a public failure Golfers in Northern Ireland things. in his home country when he didn't make the cut at Royal Port Rush. Yeah. Brick after brick after brick. When does it become too heavy? Okay, but how many things did Tiger have and he's still trying to play? Well, he so, can't play so, anymore. Oh, right. Right. He can't play, and he's still out there trying to play, and he had many more things than Rory. Public things, because he's a bigger figure than Rory. And the stage was always bigger when Tiger was on it. I hear what you're saying. And it gave me pause yesterday. The first thing I heard when he said he's not going to play for a couple of weeks, I said, oh, my God, he's I got to call he's Tony. He's licking his wounds. That's what he's doing. But he better not curl up in a fetal position. You're a professional athlete. You get through this. You do what you need to do. You call your boys. He and Tiger are apparently still close. You know, go yeah, hang out with him, together. play a few rounds. I don't want to hear. Did Vandeveld come back? Did Norman come Van back? Vandeveld was Norman a Rory. Norman was ranked number one in the world. Did he come back? Norman didn't quit. He kept playing. Well, Rory's not going to quit. I'm better just, not. I'm just asking you, when do the bricks weigh you down? Rory, what's Rory? 34 years old? 35? Is he well, 35 yet? I would say this. Younger than us. Put together. <laughs> Let's take a break. Coming up, the Panthers pulled Sergei Bobrovsky in game four. Will that linger? We're going to ask P.K. Subban. We're also going to ask him if the Oilers figured out something in that 8-1 blowout. I want him to win. Me too. I want him to win. But you're but right. He should have congratulated the winner, have. and he should have met he the press. Don't go pissed He's always there um, when he wants prize money to be bigger. Right? The Oilers try to push the Panthers to a game six tonight, and joining us from his Miami hotel room, Via FaceTime is our great friend, ESPN hockey analyst, P.K. Subban, who usually comes to us, Wilbon, in an $8,000 shirt. And is now wearing a T-shirt. Because he just got a pal. fresh cut. I know, but he got an $8,000 cut he's working on right now. Okay. Come on now. I'm just saying that now he's our pal and he doesn't have to dress for us. <laughs> Let's start with this. Panthers goalie Sergei Bobrovsky got yanked from game four, giving up five goals and giving him up quick. Do you expect something like that to linger with him? Absolutely not. He's been great throughout his career. He's always bounced back. And this season, he's been one, if not two, in terms of the top goaltenders in the league. This guy is as even keeled as they come. He never gets too high, never gets too low. I think this will be one of his best games of the season, actually. Well, he needs to, <laughs> following getting yanked and his team giving up eight goals. PK, was that a one-off in your mind, or did the Oilers find something? anything well a couple issues first of all florida panthers got to get back to their game they're letting edmonton use their speed which is the big advantage in the series for them if edmonton gets open ice especially in the neutral zone and through the middle of the ice Connor mcdavid you don't let the best player in the world walk through the middle of the ice going to end up with four points at the end of the night outside of that all of their depth players got going so that's got to be scary for florida because fogel uh, um, Holloway, all of these depth guys, Connor Brown, they all had a huge impact in game four. So, you know, for the Florida Panthers, they got to get back to their game. If they do that, it'll definitely slow down the Edmonton Oilers. All right. In your career, you were involved in all manner of leads and deficits and late in the playoffs. It's a 3-1 lead the Panthers have, but I, I think I heard you say the other night they should be concerned. Why? Well, they should be concerned for a couple reasons. Like I said, the depth of the Edmonton Oilers is feeling good about themselves right now. They all had goals, points, and contributed in game four. So they're coming in the sunrise confident as hell right now. That's a problem. Second thing, Connor McDavid played his best game of the series. Four points last game. Here's the even scarier part. Leon Dreisaitl still hasn't really showed up in this series. If he shows up today... We're probably heading back to Edmonton for game six. So for, for, for uh, the Florida Panthers, they have to find their game and find it quickly. This one could be done. Everybody assumes this to finish tonight. I picked Florida to finish this thing in six. It would not surprise me if it goes back to Edmonton. And if it does, as long as the best player in the world is still playing, I'm never going to bet against Connor McDavid. But my pick right now 
is Florida and six. So we got to see. They got to get back to their game tonight to give themselves a chance to end this thing. So we have conflict. We get you out of here on the last question, but we have conflict here because earlier in this conversation, you said you expected Bobrovsky to have one of the great games of the season. Well, the last two games at home, he had great games and they won easily. But now you're saying Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl, and if they get together, then this thing goes back and then it could go seven and so on and so forth. So we'll put you right on the spot right now. Do you indeed believe, do you indeed believe that Edmonton <laughs> is going to win this game, go back to Edmonton for Ooh, six, and then so maybe exciting. win seven in Florida? How so exciting that would be. Tony, my heart says that the Edmonton Oilers have a chance to win this game today, but my mind tells me that the Florida Panthers tossed that game four in the trash when it was 3 nothing, and that building, that building is the loudest building that I've probably ever been in for a hockey game in a long time. Aside from a couple games in Montreal, the energy that the Edmonton Oilers fans brought was astronomical. I believe that this will end tonight. I think the Florida Panthers have to come out and play their best game. You're not going to play your best hockey for two months in the playoffs. You're playing good teams. They had one bad game, and really what it was was a bad start to the game. Edmonton held it down. They're playing for their lives. Florida, if they match the desperation of the Edmonton Oilers, they'll be ho hoisting the Stanley Cup today. Thank you, PK, and it's well, a really good haircut. PK, it's really it. good. Fresh. It's a fresh cut. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, you know what I say, Wilbon. If it ain't tight, it ain't right. There you have it. That's it. I, I remember those days, PK. It's been a while. It's been 40 <laughs> years for you and me both. Let's take one last break. Still to come, the Rangers get blowed out by the Mets, but also get some good news. And more big ratings for the WNBA. I remember fresh cuts. Yeah. Tight. But it's it a, was right. But it's a long the time. The 90s. It's a long the time. The 90s. Yeah. I'm coming up on tonight on Sports Center. At Happy time, people. Happy 49th birthday, Jeff Saturday. He was a Pro Bowl center six different times, first team All Pro twice. Saturday snapped the ball almost exclusively to Peyton Manning in Indianapolis and Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay. Played 14 seasons after being undrafted out of North Carolina. Wow. Was undrafted. on the Colts Super Bowl winning team in 2006. Like so that. a lot of experts missed on him. Saturday became the interim head coach of the Colts in 2022. That did not go so well. They were 1-7. and seven. But not getting that job full-time got Saturday back on television, for which we are grateful because he is a regular guest on this high-quality cable television show. Jeff Saturday is great on television, but he was on that 2006 team. I hate. I don't like that team. They beat the Bears, they right? They beat the Bears in That's the Super Bowl. Love these Bears. Not so happy Love anniversary, Phil Mickelson. On this day 18 years ago, lefty had the lead at the U.S. Open at Wingfoot. Then on the 72nd hole, he had a drive off a hospitality tent and then hit his next shot into a tree. Mickelson ultimately double bogeyed the hole, handing the Open title to Jeff Ogilvie. The Open was Mickelson's white whale. He finished second or tied for second six different times. It's the only major Mickelson hasn't won. He has three Masters, two PGAs, one British Open. When he won the PGA in 2021, Mickelson became the oldest man to win a major ever, 50 years and 11 months. And you know, he never would have gotten there had he quit. He never would have gotten there if he'd rolled up into a ball because he choked on a putt or a drive into, into a, a tree, into a tennis into a, So he, he didn't. Fair point. Fair right? point. Phil didn't quit. Happy trails He's to last hurt. night's game for the Rangers. The champs were overwhelmed by the Mets 14 to 2. New York racked up 22 hits in winning their sixth straight game. They haven't lost since Grimace throughout the opening pitch. Coincidence? By contrast, the Rangers have lost four straight. Finished last night's game with catcher Andrew Kisner on the mound. So they'll welcome this good pitching news. Two-time Cy Young winner Jacob deGrom threw off a mound on Monday for the first time since reconstructive right elbow surgery a year ago. And three-time Cy winner Max Scherzer is back from back surgery rehab, ready to make his season debut. Maybe it's going to take a big move. Maybe they have it in them, particularly if they get those two Hall of Fame pitchers back and, and healthy over a sustained Whoa, 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 whoa. Now you got DeGrom in the Hall of Fame. He has to. He's had two sides. He, he's you got, you he's like 13 knock him and 12. All the time. No, I would knock the knuckleheads who kept voting him Cy Young for going 13 and 12 <laughs> with a great ERA. I ain't knocking DeGrom okay. ever, ever. This is the new uh, you. This is the new you.
Let's go to the big finish. The Dodgers say Mookie Betts, and I know you love him, Mookie. will need six to eight weeks to recover from his broken hand. Your thoughts? That's mid to late August. I hope he's back. I hope he can be m -m 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 Mookie by the time we get to Labor Day. That's the hope for me. Pirates rookie ace, Paul Skeens, struck out seven over six and a 4-1 win over the Reds. I know you're impressed. He's a total star. Yeah, yeah. Now, my worry is the same worry that you have. That Four he'll go for Tommy John surgery by July 20th. Yeah. But he is a total star. Yeah. Jeff Van Gundy is leaving his consultant role with the Celtics to become the Clippers' top assistant. Does that make sense to you? I, yeah, going to work for T. Lou makes sense. You don't know who the Clippers are going to have. They, I guess they could have Harden. Paul George is a free agent, could go wherever he wants. And, you know, Kawhi, you don't even know how much he's going to play. I, I don't I don't know. Good for Jeff Van Gundy. I know how much he loves coaching. I love him that he's back. WNBA has scored its top TV audience in 23 years with Sunday's game featuring Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark. You're not surprised, are you? No. Caitlin Clark moves the needle, which is why I think she should be on the Olympic team, which is ratings gold. The needle. Last one, your boy Jake Paul will tune up for Mike Tyson by boxing bare knuckle fighter Mike Perry on July 20th. Are you intrigued by that? No. I'm intrigued by Paul versus Tyson. I told you that. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time. Jane Amsterdam, shout out. Tina Thompson versus Lisa Leslie in that game X many years ago. I'm Mike Wilbon, same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. Brown told me we play our truest version of ourselves, so they have a, a complete confidence in this group, a belief in the fact that so many of their stars scored in last game. Coach Chris Knobloch told me he think that's going to give them confidence for the rest of the series. And we do know one team has come back from an 0-3 deficit to win the Stanley Cup final, but it hasn't happened since the Maple Leafs did it back in the early 40s. We'll see what happens tonight. Let's just hope for a good game, right? The puck drops at 8 Eastern on ABC and ESPN+. Plus. Thanks, Emily. All right, from the NFL, 49ers receiver Brandon Ayuk in a contract stalemate with his team took to TikTok yesterday with a FaceTime conversation with Commander's rookie quarterback Jaden Daniels, his former teammate at ASU, and Ayuk said of the Niners, they said they don't want me back. So is he saying they don't want to back this season or after this season on a long-term deal when his contract is up? Well, listen, they don't want him. Surely somebody will. Ayuk was the team's top receiver across the board, leading the Niners in targets, receptions, yards, and touchdowns. Also is the highest rated receiver in the NFL, according to ESPN Analytics overall performance grades. Senior NFL insider Adam Schefter, a guy used to putting all of these social media messages into perspective. <laughs> what do we know about Ayuk and the Niners at this point, Shefty? Well, Hannah, let me say this. Brandon Ayuk couldn't be more wrong about his statement. There is no way that the 49ers don't want him back in San Francisco. Having spoken to multiple 49ers officials multiple times during multiple months of the offseason, the message has been consistent throughout. They want back Brandon Ayuk. The disconnect here today is that the wide receiver market has exploded and the contract talks between the two sides have stalled for the time being. So Brandon Ayuk is taking the 49ers lack of ability to get a deal done with the idea that they don't want him back in San Francisco, which simply is not true. They want him back, but they want to do a deal that both sides think is fair. And with Ayuk seeing $35 million mm -hmm. go to Justin Jefferson and $28 million go to Jalen Waddle and $30 million go to Amon Ross St. Brown, he wants to be compensated like a top receiver. The Niners offers haven't gotten there yet. And because of that, he's saying they don't want me back. But in fact, they do, but they would like to do it at a contract that they find palatable. Yeah, they've got to crunch those numbers, as do other teams now, like the Dallas Cowboys and C.D. Lamb. He's so critical to that team. What's happening there, if anything? It is consistent with the way the Dallas Cowboys offseason has unfolded. They haven't gotten many deals done, and they are not close at this time to getting a deal done with C.D. Lamb. C.D. Lamb hasn't reported to minicamp. He is seeking that new contract. And again, we refer to the exploding wide receiver contract market. C.D. Lamb, by sitting back and doing nothing, has watched his price rise during the offseason. You saw the Philadelphia Eagles do deals for Devontae Smith and A.J. Brown in the week leading 
leading up to and the day of the NFL draft. The Dallas Cowboys did not do that. And I think part of the reason they didn't do that is because C.D. Lamb wanted to sit back and wait. And he wanted to wait to see how the market has unfolded. And of course, anybody could have predicted the market only was going to go up. It did. His price now has. And the Dallas Cowboys are as far along with C.D. Lamb as they are with Micah Parsons, mm. as they are with Dak Prescott, which is to say not very far along with any of these players right now. You know, Shefty, you just gave me a preview of our next segment coming up in a few minutes. We're going to talk about Dak Prescott, so we will get into that you as well, it. my friend. Shefty, back with you in just a sec. Meanwhile, today's headlines, Novak Djokovic is going to compete at this year's Paris Olympics, his fifth time representing Serbia at the Games. The 24-time Grand Slam champ is recovering from surgery on a right knee injury that forced him out of the French Open. Jeff Van Gundy joining the Clippers as Ty Lue's top assistant, sources tell Woj. The former head coach and ESPN broadcaster hasn't been on an NBA sideline since back in 2007. He spent this past season as a consultant for the Celtics. Uh, the Rangers today waving center Barclay Goudreau in a cap-cutting move. He had just four goals in the regular season, exploded for six in the playoffs, including an overtime winner in the Eastern Conference conference finals and Jake Paul announced that he will fight bare knuckle boxer Mike Perry on July 20th that had been the date that Paul was to fight Mike Tyson before medical issues for Tyson forced that bout to be moved to November and this just into Sports Center, the Washington Commanders have reached a million dollar settlement with the Virginia Attorney General as a result of a two year investment.